We have 50-50 in the United States Senate. That means we have 51 presidents. You all think I'm kidding. I've been pretty good at working with senators my whole career. But man, when you got 51 presidents, it gets harder. Any one can change the outcome. Sadly, the United States Senate, designed to be the world's greatest deliberative body, has been rendered a shell of its former self. It gives me no satisfaction in saying that as an institutionalist, as a man who was honored to serve in the Senate. But as an institutionalist, I believe that the threat to our democracy is so grave that we must find a way to pass these voting rights bills. Debate them. Vote. Let the majority prevail. And if that bare minimum is blocked, we have no option but to change the Senate rules, including getting rid of the filibuster for this. <laughs> you know, last year, if I'm not mistaken, the filibuster was used 154 times. Filibuster has been used to generate compromise in the past, promote some bipartisanship, but it's also used to obstruct, including especially obstruct civil rights and voting rights. And when it was used, senators traditionally used to have to stand and speak at their desk for however long it took. And sometimes it took hours. And when they sat down, if no one immediately stood up, anyone could call for a vote or the debate ended. But that doesn't happen today. Senators no longer even have to speak one word. Filibuster is not used by Republicans to bring the Senate together, but to pull it further apart. Filibuster has been weaponized and abused. While the state legislative assault on voting rights is simple, all you need in your House and Senate is a pure majority. In the United States Senate, it takes a supermajority, 60 votes even to get a vote instead of 50 to protect the right to vote. State legislators can pass anti-voting laws with simple majority. If they can do that, then the United States Senate should be able to protect voting rights by a simple majority. Today, I'm making it clear, to protect our democracy, I support changing the Senate rules whichever way they need to be changed to prevent a minority of senators from blocking action on voting rights. <coughs> when it comes to protecting majority rule in America, the majority should rule in the United States Senate. I make this announcement with careful deliberation, recognizing the fundamental right to vote is a right from which all other rights flow. And I make it with an appeal to my Republican colleagues, to those Republicans who believe in the rule of law, to restore the bipartisan tradition of voting rights. The people who restored it, who abided by it in the past, were Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush. They all supported the Voting Rights Act. Don't let the Republican Party morph into something else. Restore the institution of the Senate the way it was designed to be. Senate rules were just changed to raise the debt ceiling so we wouldn't renege on our debt for the first time in our history to prevent an economic crisis. That was done by a simple majority. As Senator Warnock said a few weeks ago in a powerful speech, if we change the rules to protect the full faith and credit of the United States, we should be able to change the rules to protect the heart and soul of our democracy. He was right. In the days that followed John Lewis's death, there was an outpouring of praise and support across the political spectrum. But as we stand here today, it isn't enough just to praise his memory. We must translate eulogy into action. We need to follow John Lewis's footsteps. We need to support the bill in his name. 
Just a few days ago, we talked about, up in the Congress and the White House, the event coming up shortly to celebrate Dr. King's birthday. And Americans of all stripes will praise him for the content of his character. But as Dr. King's family said before, it's not enough to praise their father. They even said, on this holiday, don't celebrate his birthday unless you're willing to support what he lived for and what he died for. The next few days, when these bills come to a vote, will mark a turning point in this nation's history. We will choose. The issue is, will we choose? Democracy over autocracy, light over shadows, justice over injustice. I know where I stand. I will not yield. I will not flinch. I will defend the right to vote, our democracy against all enemies, foreign and, yes, domestic. And the question is, where will the institution of the United States Senate stand? Every senator, Democrat, Republican, and Independent will have to declare where they stand, not just for the moment, but for the ages. Will you stand against voter suppression? Yes or no? That's the question they'll answer. Will you stand ele against election subversion? <clears throat> yes or no? Will you stand for democracy? Yes or no? And here's one thing every senator and every American should remember. History has never been kind to those who've sided with voter suppression over voters' rights. And it will be even be less kind for those who side with election subversion. So I ask every elected official in America, how do you want to be remembered? At consequential moments in history, they present a choice. Do you want to be the side, the side of Dr. King or George Wallace? Do you want to be on the side of John Lewis or Bull Connor? Do you want to be on the side of Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis? This is the moment to decide, to defend our elections, to defend our democracy. <laughs> and if you do that, you will not be alone. That's because the struggle to protect voting rights has never been born by one group alone. We saw freedom riders of every race, leaders of every faith marching arm in arm. And yes, Democrats and Republicans in Congress of the United States and in the presidency. I did not live the struggles of Douglas, Tubman, King, Lewis, Goodman, Cheney, Werner, countless others, known and unknown. I did not walk in the shoes of generations of students who walked these grounds, but I walked other grounds, because I'm so damn old I was there as well. <laughs> they think I'm kidding, man. <laughs> Seems like yesterday, the first time I got arrested. Anyway, <laughs> but their struggles here they were the ones that opened my eyes as a high school student in the, late, in the late 50s and early 60s. They got me more engaged in the work of my life. And what we're talking about today is rooted in the very idea of America. The idea that Anel Ponder, who graduated from Clark, Atlanta, captured in a single word. She was a teacher and a librarian was also an unyielding champion of voting rights. In 1963, when I was just starting college and university, after registering voters in Mississippi, she was pulled off a bus, arrested and jailed, where she was brutally beaten. In her cell next to her was Fannie Lou Hamer, who described the beating this way, and I quote, I could hear the sounds of the licks and the horrible screams. They beat her. I don't know for how long. And after a while, she began to pray and ask God to have mercy on those people. Anel Ponder's friends 
visit her the next day. Her face was badly swollen. She could hardly talk, but she managed to whisper, whisper one word, freedom, freedom, the only word she whispered. After nearly 250 years since our founding, that singular idea still echoes, but it's up to all of us to make sure it never fades, especially the students here, your generation, that just started voting, as there are those who are trying to take away that vote, vote you just started to be able to exercise. But the giants we honor today were your age when they made clear who we must be as a nation. Not a joke. Think about it. In the early 60s, we're sitting where you're sitting. They were you. And like them, you give me much hope for the future. Before and after in our lives, in the life of this nation, democracy is who we are, who we must be now and forever. So let's stand in this breach together. Let's love good, establish justice in the gate. And remember, as I said, there is one, this is one of those defining moments in American history. Each of those who vote will be remembered by class after class in the 50s and 60s, the 2000s and 50s and 60s. Each one of the members of the Senate is going to be judged by history on where they stood before the vote and where they stood after the vote. There's no escape. So let's get back to work.